Thank you, Christine, for these uh, very kind words. Uh, I'm really uh, appreciative and excited to receive this award. Uh, I've had the opportunity to be part of the forming of this new field, the new community, and uh, I have a great admiration to the work done by uh, ISCB, and I thank the society and the committee for uh, the award. Uh, when I uh, introduce my group I, uh, at Tel Aviv, I typically say that we work on these uh, five topics, all related. Uh, and uh, typically in each topic, when uh, we develop an algorithm and we get feedback from the uh, biological community that it's useful, then we turn it into uh, freely available software. And some of these tools has been very broadly used uh, by the uh, community. Over the years, the uh, balance has changed. Uh, some topics are now uh, less uh, uh, active than others developed. Uh, and uh, part of it is due to uh, development of new biotechnology uh, or new data types that make it available. Let's see, how do I get... Let me hide this. Oops. Let's hide this. Uh... Oh. Or end screen share. Okay, great. Oh, no, 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 I gotta, I gotta um, go back and share it again. I'm gonna let the tech girl do it. <laughs> I'm failing today. Sorry, everyone. I thought I had that under control. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the, the vision that uh, I believe uh, all of us share is to try to have an impact on uh, actual medicine. And uh, rather than the current medicine where everybody is treated uh, in the same way, and some are helped, some are uh, not affected, and some are even damaged. Uh, we want to tailor the uh, treatment based on additional data and computation so that each one is uh, received the treatment, a treatment that will be beneficial. And of course, for this, uh, uh, data and computation are uh, fundamental. Uh, so I'm going to talk about several uh, stories of uh, current or recent work in my group, and uh, I won't get uh, too technical, but because uh, I want to cover uh, uh, several topics. So the first work is uh, led by Nimrod, a PhD student in the group, and uh, we wanted to try to use the multi-omics data that is currently available. The most notable resource is TCGA, which makes available uh, several tens of thousands of uh, uh, patient uh, uh, samples, cancer patient samples from multiple cancers. And for each of them, we have uh, five or six different omics, mutations, copy number, gene expression, uh, methylation, etc., and about a few dozen clinical parameters. <clears throat> And the question is, can we identify uh, patient uh, subtypes based on using these multiple omics together better than 
is done uh, individually by each omic. And, and, and the difficulty is, uh, the difficulty is, of course, that uh, these data types are extremely different we, uh, statistically, and uh, merging them is, is a challenge. So uh, we looked at the literature, and there were actually quite a few methods for doing multi-omic clustering of a variety of techniques. Here are uh, some uh, examples of the algorithms. And in fact, uh, there are uh, even uh, methods uh, developed uh, uh, in, uh, in machine learning and applied to uh, uh, different uh, topics, uh, images, etc. But uh, most of them were not used uh, on uh, uh, multi-omic data. And so as, as, as a start, we decided to benchmark these methods. Uh, we looked at 10 cancer data sets, each of them with a few hundreds uh, patients. And we focused on uh, three uh, omics, which we understand best, gene expression, DNA methylation, and microRNA expression. And we set aside the clinical information uh, in order to evaluate the results. And the evaluation was uh, as follows. We obtain a clustering by each method. And uh, each, uh, since we have the survival information for each patient, we can compare the survival plots of the a different cluster and uh, measure uh, how different they are using the log rank test. Uh, and we also can use the clinical labels. There were about six clinical labels that were common to all, almost all the cancer types that we used. And uh, I'll show you the results soon, together with uh, a new method that we developed. Excuse me, I need to interrupt for just one moment, sure. please. Your slides are not showing to our virtual audience, so we want to make sure we fix that quickly. Thank you so much, Ron. Thank you, Ron, and we promise you, you'll get your full time. <laughs> Thank you so very much. <laughs> okay, so uh, part of what we learned in the from this benchmark led us to developing a new uh, neighborhood-based uh, uh, method. So uh, the method is uh, uh, based on the following similarity scores. So uh, we have, uh, let's look at the profile of patient I in a particular omics and focus on the K nearest neighbors in, uh, uh, of that uh, individual in that omics. And we define the uh, sample similarity uh, as uh, between uh, I and J uh, in the formula that uh, we see. So uh, we, it's, a rad, it's a variant of the radial basis kernel. And the normalization factor, the sigma, is uh, using the uh, average similarity of I to its neighbors, uh, average similarity of J to its neighbors, and average of the old similarity. Uh, in this way, we factor in situation where uh, one, uh, one of I and J has a different uh, uh, distribution or distances of the neighbors. And the relative similarity of I and J is calculated of, uh, as the similarity 
uh, as a fraction of the similarity to all its neighbors for i and for j for the relevant neighbors. So notice that if uh, uh, i is not among the k nearest neighbors of j and j is not in the k nearest neighbors of i, then this similarity will be zero. Uh, and the integration step is as so, so all I described is just for per omic, a simple similarity, neighbor similarity score per omic. And to the integration is as simple as we can uh, show. It's just average the similarities across the omics, the simplest thing that one can think of. So uh, our algorithm is called NEMO, and it computes the similarities as I just described. And then it performs spectral clustering, a classical uh, uh, clustering algorithm uh, applied to the Laplacian graph. And we, in order to determine the number of clusters, we do a slight uh, twist on the uh, uh, Eigengap method. So the Eigengap method uh, orders the eigenvalues and, the, the, and looks for the largest gap. And we multiply this by i, the index of the difference, because we wanted to nudge the number of clusters a bit uh, higher up. So k is the parameter of the methods, uh, of the method. And uh, one advantage of this method is that it can, uh, did not, does not need to do imputation because we can directly address missing data simply in the formula that we see here. We just summarize over the uh, omics for which the data is available. <clears throat> so uh, here are the results. We compared the uh, NEMO to the nine method that I showed you before. Uh, and on the first row, you see that uh, out of the 10 uh, class, uh, cancer types, uh, NEMO had the largest number of uh, uh, cancers for which uh, the survival was different among the clusters. Uh, it also had the, the largest uh, <coughs> number of uh, uh, cancer types with uh, significant class, uh, clinical enrichment tied with the three other methods. Uh, in terms of the number of clusters, you see that it's sort of uh, mid-level. There are uh, methods that have as many as uh, 10 clusters on average and as few as 2.2. Uh, and uh, NEMO gives uh, on average something like uh, four to five clusters. And in terms of runtime, it is the second fastest. The only faster method is uh, as the spectral clustering because it uses, uh, NEMO uses spectral as a subroutine. Here is another view of the results. So here we show the average uh, log uh, rank uh, p value over the 10 cancer types uh, on the x axis and the average number of significant clinical parameters on the y-axis, and you see that on the Pareto optimal contour, there are three methods, RMKL, NEMO, and MCCA. There's no one uh, clear winner, but definitely uh, uh, these methods do best. Uh, incidentally, one of them is a method from uh, uh, machine learning that was not applied to multi-omics before. And on the other hand, the method used by the TCGA uh, uh, analysis in their uh, seminal papers is I cluster based that according to this analysis is, uh, is uh, not performing as well as the others. <clears throat> Here is one specific example. This is analysis of uh, uh, AML, a type of leukemia. Uh, we, the cohort had uh, nearly 200 patients, and we used the same three omics. Only 170 of them had full data. And what you see on the right is the uh, uh, survival plots of the five clusters obtained by uh, NEMO. And the results of NEMO were uh, better than all other algorithms better than just looking at the 170 samples with full data and better than any single omic separately. 
this was not always the case. There were cases where sing, on, in some other cancer types that single omic uh, did better than multi omics. Uh, and also when we compared it to what is known about AML, there is the French American board classification of AML. The, we, there was a good match and in particular for one subtype uh, APL. So to summarize this part, uh, we uh, perform an extensive benchmark of uh, multi-omic clustering. Some machine learning methods uh, uh, do <clears throat> well. And we developed our own algorithm, which is quite uh, simple based on a, a new similarity kernel and a simple integration step. Uh, overall, it performed best, but not uniformly. Uh, uh, it was uh, the best one, uh, and uh, this make us uh, do some follow-up work that I will not describe, uh, trying to come up with more general model. For example, we, de we developed a model where the, the set of omics used in each cluster could be different. And we also noticed an important point that the long rank, log rank p-value uh, approximation is not uh, doing a good job on these cancer data set. This is the standard way using the asymptotics of the chi-square uh, for the approximation. It gives two optimistic results and we implemented the method that uh, performs an exact test. Let me uh, move on, and this is another multi-omic uh, project, and it's led by uh, Jonathan together with uh, Nimrod. And here uh, we are looking at more schematically at the integration challenge. So in red, you see the situation where you have just one omic, but multiple data set. And this is a well-studied problem, and it calls for batch correction and uh, I think uh, this is by you now well done. In blue, you see the uh, situation where we have the same data set, but uh, multiple omics. And this is the kind of uh, uh, problem that we just uh, described. Uh, but the most general case is where we have both multiple omics and multiple data sets. Uh, and when our focus here will be in a situation where we have a gene expression and DNA methylation, but on a different data set. So, so it's a bit covered. So we have one data set where we have only gene expression and another data set where we have only methylation and we want to uh, be able to analyze them together. So uh, here is what we uh, do. Uh, we start in a training set where we have data set for which both uh, DNA methylation and gene expression are available. And we uh, use uh, regression to learn the uh, predictor of uh, the gene expression based on the methylation site and we focus on the methyl most of the methylation sites that are around the gene. Actually, we noticed that the gene body and the 5' UTR are, are not helpful, so all the sites that fall outside these regions but within plus minus 10 kb from the gene. And each, uh, we, the output of this phase is the 2,000 models with the highest uh, R-square score. And then uh, for the embedding, this, the input is two data sets. For uh, the first, we have only DNA methylation, and the second, we have only gene expression. And uh, we uh, use the models that we had from the uh, uh, training set, and we predict in the first data set uh, the gene expression, and then uh, we uh, restrict the gene set to only those that have a uh, high variance in uh, both uh, DNA methylation and the gene expression. And on the reduced uh, gene set, uh, we embed the uh, gene expression from data set two and the predicted gene expression uh, on data set one 
uh, to a low dimension, uh, d-dimensional space using uh, uh, CCA, uh, canonical correlation analysis. Uh, we call this algorithm uh, intent. Okay, so let me show you some uh, results. Uh, here we looked again at TCGA, uh, 11 cancer types uh, from uh, TCGA where we had both DNA methylation and gene expression, a few hundred samples per uh, type. And uh, we repeatedly trained uh, on uh, 10 cancer types and uh, predicted on the 11th. Okay, so we set aside one cancer type, we trained on the uh, remaining and the uh, predicting of the 11. And since we had both the expression uh, and the predicted expression in the uh, in the 11th, we could evaluate the result by seeing how close is the uh, embedding, the embedding of the gene expression to the to the true gene expression. And the measure used in the literature is called the fraction of samples closer than the true match. Okay, so each sample has its true match because we know in this case where uh, where. Uh, what is the match between the gene expression and the embedded uh, gene expression. And uh, the lowest this uh, score, which I don't even know how to pronounce, FOSC-TTM, uh, the better. Uh, so you see here uh, uh, several integration methods uh, uh, and the uh, intent is in green and uh, as you can see, it has uh, uniformly the lowest uh, uh, value, typically by uh, one or two orders of magnitude. Here is one specific example. So this is uh, colon adenocarcinoma. Uh, in A, you see the uh, UMAP uh, projection of the methylation of the gene expression separately. And uh, in uh, this, the middle row, you see the results of the uh, uh, embedding, uh, the UMAP of the embedding by each of the four methods, Intent, Liger, SARA, and MMDMA. And uh, first of all, by I, the mixing of uh, Intent uh, looks uh, the best, I guess, followed by MMDMA here. And uh, I hope you can see it. We marked 10 uh, random uh, uh, samples uh, in B. Uh, they are marked, uh, num num numbered 1 to 10. And in uh, the lower row, you see where these points uh, uh, fall in the embedding. And you see that in uh, intent, uh, the red and the green uh, numbers that are identical tend to be closer to each other than in the other cases. So this is just a more uh, uh, impression uh, than what the Fox TTM tells you uh, quantitatively. Another test that we did, they looked at uh, integrating multiple cancer types. So here we, uh, the input was uh, almost 1,500 uh, profiles from four uh, cancer types. And uh, the label of the cancer type was hidden from the algorithm. And we trained on the remaining several cancer types. And we embedded uh, all the samples together. And the idea is to see whether, uh, in addition to the mixing that we uh, obtained before, uh, we also uh, how the methods keep separate the different cancer types. So Fox TTM again was two orders of magnitude better. Uh, and uh, on the second row, you could see the uh, project, the UMAPs of the embedding of the four methods. Again, uh, Intel shows better mixing than the other. And in the third row, you see the coloring according to the four cancer types. Uh, in this case, uh, Serra also does a good job in terms of separating the four cancer types. 
and I guess also M and DMA, but on the other hand, their mixing is uh, quite poor. And in the uh, bottom row, you see a quantification of this uh, partition into subtypes. So also in multiple cancer type integration, we obtain uh, uh, good results. Here is one specific example uh, on uh, uh, melanoma. Uh, here we uh, split the samples uh, where, and used the, uh, methylation from half of them and gene expression from the other and uh, did the embedding of these two halves and then uh, clustered separately uh, the DNA methylation uh, on the, in A. Uh, the gene expression in B and the embedding in C. And you see that uh, the separation that we get between the survival plot in C is uh, equal, uh, almost equally uh, good as that of B and much better than the original DNA methylation. So even, they, even though we only use the DNA methylation from half of the samples, on this half we obtain much better uh, uh, survival plot. So to summarize this part, uh, we developed uh, in 10 the method to uh, integrate uh, DNA methylation and gene expression from different data set by uh, learning uh, models uh, and then embedding uh, to a joint space. Uh, currently, the embedding is done using uh, CCA. The fact that we know what is expected to be the relation between the two omics is crucial here. Uh, and the question is, can this be applied to additional omic pairs? Uh, we believe it can, but it requires uh, additional study. And also, as I said, we are now using uh, CCA uh, for the uh, embedding phase, but uh, there are uh, very good, broadly used uh, single omic multiple data methods developed mainly for single cell data that maybe we can apply them instead and perhaps improve the embedding. Okay, story number three, and this is a, 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 another work on cancer risk led by Dan Koster, a PhD a MD student in my group, in collaboration with uh, uh, colleagues from Tel Aviv and from uh, uh, Ichilov Hospital. So we are dealing with breast cancer here, uh, the most uh, prevalent uh, uh, cancer in women. And uh, since one in eight women will uh, uh, develop breast cancer during her lifetime, uh, uh, women undergo uh, tests, uh, including a clinical uh, breast exam and mammography uh, in order to uh, detect uh, the cancer uh, early. And these tests are inaccurate, they are expensive, and uh, uh, they are uh, unpleasant. And uh, our question was, can we use data from standard uh, electronic medical records uh, in order to provide early prediction of cancer? So the cohort that we used was a cohort uh, generated in uh, Ichilov Hospital, the Suraski Medical Center. And over uh, almost 20 years, people come for routine checkups. These are healthy people that are typically sent by their employer every year or two to undergo uh, a standard tests. So they do this every couple of years. And each of such tests is a whole uh, a regime of a whole day. Uh, they go a, a battery of uh, nearly collecting nearly 600 uh, features per visit. A very uh, substantial number. And of this cohort, there were about 6,400 women uh, and uh, 11, uh, almost 12,000 uh, uh, visits. And the label that we used used the cancer registry in Israel, since every in Israel every 
individual has a, a national ID and uh, we can match the ID from the test, uh, from the checkups with the cancer registry and identify those women who developed uh, breast cancers uh, within two years from their last visit. Sorry, this is covered here. So uh, we set out to see uh, whether we can predict these uh, cancer cases. So we focused on the uh, CBC, the complete uh, blood uh, count tests, uh, BMI and age. And uh, we plotted here, you see here the uh, mean and standard deviation of uh, these parameters for the breast cancer, uh, 77 women and for the rest. And not surprisingly, age is highly uh, significantly different between the two groups, uh, 47 versus 53. Uh, so uh, to correct for this, what we did was to create a, a sub-cohort of the cancer-free with matching parameter values to those of the breast cancer cohort. And indeed, after, uh, uh, after uh, selecting this subset, we see no, dif no significant uh, uh, different feature between the two sets. So now we are comparing these uh, two sets of 77 positives and some 3,600 negatives. So uh, let, let's look at the data temporarily. So, uh, uh, patient or individual join the uh, study at a particular age. Uh, and this is the so-called left translocation point. And they either uh, uh, leave the study uh, at, at when the study ends, or they are diagnosed with cancer. So in the terminology of uh, survival uh, theory, this is called a failure event. And uh, <clears throat> the uh, Kaplan-Meier estimator uh, measures the probability that the patient is cancer-free as a function of age in this case. And uh, this is the survival plots we all also saw before. Uh, the, the problem is here that we have multiple visits per individual. So we cannot use the survival, uh, uh, the Kaplan-Meier uh, plots as is. So the trick is to use a, what is called pseudo-objecting. So we break each uh, subject into pseudo-objects uh, between uh, consecutive uh, visits with the data of that point. And uh, in order to uh, make the data more dense, we also uh, add the age as a covariate and uh, make the starting point of each first visit to be uh, zero. And uh, this is the data that, uh, to which we will apply uh, the uh, survival analysis and the log rank test. And how, what do we do? Uh, we use a uh, 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 survival tree uh, analysis. So we have our cohort. We try every threshold for every feature. And this splits the cohort into two. And we compare the survival plots of the two sub-cohorts. Uh, using the log rank score, and we split according to the most significant uh, uh, p-value. And we do this repeatedly until uh, we reach the leaves where uh, no uh, significant partition is, uh, no further significant partition is available. And we do it, this not once, but for hundreds of trees. So each time we use a random subset of k covariates per node. And uh, we have our set of, say, 500 trees. And then given a new sample, we just propagate the sample along each tree. We reach the uh, leaf. Each leaf has a corresponding survival plot. And we average the survival plot of the 500 trees 
and this would be the predicted survival uh, plot of, of this sample. Okay, so we, we combined here three tricks, all of them well known. The first is uh, to do this uh, pseudo-objecting, the second is to use the survival tree, uh, and the third is to uh, apply uh, an ensemble method, the uh, random forest in this case. So here are the results. On the left, uh, you see the breast cancer results. In blue is our approach. And uh, in the other colors, you see the methods that were available before. Uh, on the x-axis is the time to diagnosis uh, from half a year to two years. And you see that uh, our approach is uh, uniformly better. The y-axis is the AUPR. Uh, similar results are uh, obtained using the AUC. Uh, on the right, we uh, applied the same analysis to a cohort of uh, prostate cancer in men. So we had uh, uh, some 11,000 uh, men, of which 56 were diagnosed with prostate cancer within two years. And again, we see an improvement of our methods over uh, prior art, particularly in the first year uh, uh, for events happening in the coming year. Okay, uh, we also computed the variable importance. I won't get into the uh, me, uh, importance uh, parameters, but uh, each of them is improving. Both the x-axis and the y-axis are improving when they increase. And we see uh, several uh, uh, important features in, in addition to age, which you can see in green in the, uh, in the lower right. So all these features are related to uh, inflammation and to, uh, to immune system, and it uh, matches the understanding that breast cancer is, uh, uh, has a systemic inflammation uh, response. So to summarize uh, uh, this part, uh, we came up with a, a method for better personalized prediction. Uh, it is uh, complementary to the existing screening practices of uh, mammography and uh, uh, clinical uh, breast exam. Uh, interestingly, we had some uh, 25 women who underwent uh, mammography and clinical breast exam during their, uh, uh, during their uh, checkup and later developed uh, a breast cancer. And for three or four of them, in, in fact, three or four of those with the highest scores according to our algorithm, they were missed by both mammography and the clinical breast exam. So this is a Anecdotal, the numbers are small, but this gives the hope that we could uh, uh, we could use this as a complementary way to uh, to improve uh, the early warning methods. So we are currently uh, expanding this cohort. We have uh, uh, obtained uh, access to additional data sets from other uh, checkup uh, uh, at other hospitals in Israel. We have. I think by now about 100,000 uh, individuals, and the hope is that uh, this will improve the results and also enable us to look at other cancer types. Of course, we focused on breast cancer for women and uh, prostate for men because these are the most prevalent ones, and the number of positives that we could identify was largest for these groups, but with the largest cohort, we may we will be looking at additional cancer types and hopefully come up with additional results. Okay, switching gears now, let me uh, uh, move to a network-based uh, story. And this is the work of Hagai, a PhD student jointly supervised by Rani Elkon from the med school at Tel Aviv and myself. And we are going back to an old problem, actually, 20 year old problem. And this is the following problem. You're given a, a, an activity profile of a, a, some 
situation or some uh, uh, disease that obtained from a set of patients, or more recently, you could obtain you obtain the significantly uh, uh, the significant genes in a GWAS study of a particular uh, phenotype. And we want to tie this set of active genes to uh, what we know about the biology uh, using a network. So we are given a large network, say a PPI, protein-protein interaction network, and we want to uh, find active sub subnetworks. So sub subnetworks, typically connected subnetworks, the, and then uh, for each subnetwork we do a go enrichment analysis in order to find uh, to identify which processes are uh, active, uh, uh, highly active in this cell. And there are. Uh, Dozens of algorithms that do this, starting with Idecker's seminal work some 20 years ago. And uh, we looked again at this problem and we realized that something, something is worrying is happening. So we do the following. We permute the gene names, or if you wish, we per permute the activity profile and we run the algorithm. And uh, we compare the uh, significant terms that we obtain in the, on the true network and on the permuted, uh, name permuted network. And you see on the, on the right that sometimes you get a very large number of terms that are supposedly significant on the uh, permuted network. And sometimes there is a substantial overlap between the sets. So most uh, uh, active, active model identification algorithm, uh, they report numerous terms even after the permutation, which makes you think, uh, are these terms biologically meaningful? Maybe we are just picking up a signal that is already there in the network because we know that biological network have this tendency to have hubs in them and the degree distribution is very, uh, non even. So we need to uh, procedure to filter the irrelevant terms. And uh, we call, uh, we, we develop such a procedure. I won't uh, show it, it's in the paper. And we call the, the terms that pass such an evaluation uh, empirically validated terms. And we also need criteria to evaluate the solution quality. And we do have developed some. And I'll focus here on a robust algorithm that survives such a test and uh, uh, gives us a, a high fraction of empirically validated terms. So here is our algorithm. It's called Domino. Uh, we, we start by a one-time process where we take the large network, the, say the PPI network, and we uh, partition it uh, into highly connected subnetwork uh, called slices using, we, we use the Louvain algorithm for this because it's fast and it can work on, on huge networks. And then we continue on each uh, slice separately. And uh, first of all, we filter those slices that don't contain enough active genes using a very mild FDR uh, 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 threshold. And then on those that survive, uh, we uh, refine each uh, slice into subslice using the price collecting Steiner tree. So we want, if you wish, uh, to find a subnetwork uh, that will connect many of the red the red are the active nodes in each uh, 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 in each slice, and then uh, we partition it uh, each slice into uh, uh, modules using the Newman-Girvan uh, modularity algorithm, and finally uh, we report uh, only those modules that fa that pass a, a Bonferroni correction uh, threshold in terms of the number of active genes in there. Okay, so, so far we did two 
uh, statistical tests, but they are only for the enrichment of the red nodes in, in what we report. We haven't looked at the, the go terms at all. And these are uh, the sets that we report, those uh, uh, sets uh, encircled by black and with a check mark next to them. So this is the domino algorithm. Uh, and note, as I said, that the first step is only done once because uh, we, and we use the same initial partition uh, in, independent of the data. So uh, for, for as a benchmark, we applied uh, uh, to 10 uh, gene expression activity profiles and 10 GWAS gene sets, and we use the deep network. And here are the results. So let's look first at the bottom. Uh, so each uh, column is an algorithm, and uh, you see here the number of terms that pass the empirical validation. The blue bar is the average, and the spots are the different uh, data sets. On uh, the uh, left is the gene expression, on the right is the GWAS. And you see that the domino uh, reports uh, the highest or nearly the highest number of terms. And more importantly, when you look at the, uh, the top row, you see that the fraction of empirically validated terms uh, reported by uh, uh, Domino is the highest, uh, followed by netbox. And in, in the additional tests that we did, so here you see all the six parameters that we developed. I won't be, I won't describe them, uh, but you see that uh, uh, Domino performs best in almost all parameters, and Netbox is uh, second best. And this is both on gene expression and on GWAS. Interestingly, uh, even though we have uh, we have uh, numerical values. All our analysis uh, use just uh, the gene as a gene set, those that passed the threshold or, or did not. The differential genes without their scores, because in our test, we didn't see an improvement by using the actual values. Uh, we also apply this to two other networks, uh, uh, Huri and String. And, and, and we tested both Netbook and, and, and Domino. And again, we see an advantage of uh, uh, Domino in, in, those, in all cases. So to summarize, uh, we developed uh, a method to uh, triage or uh, go terms reported by uh, uh, model finding algorithms. And we developed our own method called Domino that uh, uh, seems to be performing best. A short time after we published this, uh, there was an, uh, another extensive uh, independent matchup, benchmark die, done by uh, Jan Baumbach's group. And they actually uh, report that uh, uh, except for Domino, the tested algorithm do not produce biologically more meaningful candidate disease models uh, than on random networks with the same uh, node degrees. So basically, they uh, confirm our results. And uh, the, the software is available. And uh, we also we also have a server so that one can use online submit the, uh, the gene sets and obtain visualization and uh, uh, quantitative assessment. Okay, uh, last story. Am I doing okay on time? Okay, so this is a work of Gal, a master's student in the group who has now moved to the industry. And we are talking here about finding uh, driver genes in uh, cancer. So we know that uh, uh, cancer is uh, caused by uh, mutations that uh, confer growth advantage to cells and cause them to pro proliferate. And the common wisdom is that there are few uh, drivers that accumulate uh, a long time per cancer. 
Uh, and there are many other uh, mutations that are so-called passengers, namely they are uh, neutral in terms of uh, growth advantage. And uh, uh, the challenge is to identify the drivers because uh, if we want to treat a patient, we want to know uh, which, which genes are uh, the problematic. And actually there have been dozens of uh, studies to detect driver genes in cohorts. And there is uh, the CGC, a database that uh, contains about 500 uh, validated driver genes. And uh, our goal is to do uh, the, uh, to find the driver genes on an individual patient. So all the CGC talks about the cohort level and we want to do the same in the individual, uh, uh, based on the individual's data. And we want actually also to prioritize the, the, the putative driver gene. So why is this needed? So here you see an example of the distribution of the number of known drivers identified in a lung uh, adenocarcinoma uh, uh, cohort. And you see, uh, on the left red bar, that there are some patients where there are zero known drivers available in it. And on the other hand, on the right in red, you see that there are quite a, a large number of patients where the number of, putate, the number of known drivers detected is 10 or more. So if we cannot do combination therapy with 10 uh, drugs, even if we have targets to all these genes. So we want to prioritize to rank the genes in terms of their uh, chance to be uh, drivers in this individual and uh, so that we will be able to use it for uh, personalized uh, medication eventually. So there were previous approaches that tried to do uh, the same. Uh, Don rank and SCS, and uh, again they use the network approach. Uh, they use a large uh, PPI network uh, plus the gene expression and the uh, mutation profile of the individuals in order to uh, predict the drivers. Uh, the, the drawback is that uh, PPI networks are noisy, they are inaccurate, and they are also biased. We also mentioned this problem of, uh, uh, of hubs. So we developed our own algorithm called the Prodigy. And uh, uh, the objective is to rank the genes that are mutated in an individual's data by their chance to be drivers. And we use mutation, gene expression, and a global PPI network. And the twist that we add is that we uh, collect the signal across uh, multiple pathways. So we don't look at the, only at the global network, but we collect signals from individual pathways by using uh, uh, pathway database uh, like uh, Reactor. So here's the rationale of the method. So suppose what you see is the, uh, the net sub-network corresponding to a particular pathway, and the, red, uh, the, the gray gene is the mutated, and we suspect that it is the driver. And in red, you see the differentially, uh, oh, it's actually yellow on your screen. Uh, on mine, it's red. On yellow, you see the uh, uh, genes that are differentially expressed. So if the gray guy is the driver, somehow the signal should propagate from across the pathway from the gray uh, uh, node to the, some of the red nodes. Uh, uh, to explain the, the differential expression. So mathematically model this as the price collecting Steiner tree. So we want something like this. Here is a sub-network that best explains the data. 
Uh, and as you see, it does not explain all the yellow nodes, but it explains most of them. And of course, there are weights to the uh, to the nodes and the negative or or penalties to the edges. I won't get into the values. And the point is that we do this for hundreds of pathways and summarize the evidence across uh, these pathways. So we uh, compare the method to DORNREC and SCS, and also to three graph centrality measures, degree, closeness, and betweenness. And we used only uh, uh, SNVs, uh, single nuclear variations. So uh, there were some 250 CGC genes that, that were known to have uh, validated the driver uh, uh, SNVs, and we used this set as the gold standard and computed precision recall in F1. And here is the first result. So here we use the reactome uh, set of pathways, and we use the networks, the, the network that was used in the two previous studies. And on the x-axis, you see the number of uh, the ranking of the genes from 1 to 20. And on the uh, y-axis, you see the average F1. So this is a summary over the whole cohort, but the measure is done individually. And as you see, uh, Prodigy is uh, doing better than both uh, Donrek and SCS. Here is another test. So here we tested three uh, pathway databases, uh, Reactom, NCI, and KEG. And in addition to uh, the three algorithms, we also uh, tested the betweenness, closeness, as degree. So in this, for these three methods, we don't look at the expression data at all. What we do is that we uh, rank the genes according to their uh, degree we, we rank the mutated genes uh, according to their degree or the closeness or their between. So this does, is, is oblivious to the patient data except the mutation. So again, uh, 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 Prodigy is doing better than Donrek and SCS. Interestingly, uh, some of the uh, uh, network centrality measures are actually doing uh, uniformly better than Donrek and NCS. So this means that just by looking at the network and ignoring the patient data, one can obtain a better result. So this shows us again the, the caveats on uh, using uh, uh, biological networks that we have seen in the previous study. So one has to be extra careful uh, when uh, looking at such uh, uh, networks. So to summarize this part, uh, we developed uh, a tool for uh, personalized ranking of driver genes. Uh, it does better than the extant methods, uh, some which turn out to be dominated by a, a network topology, uh, unlike ours. Uh, it has the advantage of being able to identify rare and unknown drivers. And the key was to collect signal uh, across uh, multiple pathways in order to improve uh, performance. OK, so uh, I have a lot to thank. Uh, <laughs> first of all, uh, my wife, Michal, who is here, partner in life. Uh, I've had a really fantastic uh, group of students across the years. I think by now 16 of them are in academic positions. I'm very, very proud of them and I continue to collaborate with many of them. I also had many research partners uh, in Israel and uh, internationally across uh, the year, uh, along the years. And I've learned a lot from all of them and I thank them uh, for uh, their partnership, and uh, particularly my current uh, research group. And I thank again the society for this uh, wonderful, great honor.
really powerful message that I'm sure there are many points. Thank, thank you. Thank you for the fantastic talk. Uh, many powerful methods, and I'm sure there are many points to be made. So, um, questions, please. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. Uh, great talk. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I had a question. Um, I mean, I recognize in breast cancer work, uh, production work that you're doing, you want to remove the effect of the age because it has such a big, you know, signal. And also, you, I mean, individuals, younger women, for instance, want to know their risk given their metrics rather than, you know, the, the cohort, their age cohort's risk. Um, however, I wonder if by age matching, you remove the possibility to observe an interaction between age and the metrics that you're looking at. Uh, what do you think of that? So uh, I think that, uh, I mean, we, we needed a way to uh, to factor out the the age. It's, it's actually a dominant uh, factor in every cancer that we looked at. So uh, you're right that the possibility of interaction still exists, but as you could say that what we did was a first approximation. Of course, we only currently use 25 clinical parameters, or in the case of a, a, a prostate, we use some 40, and eventually we want to do it with the whole 600 of them. But you're right, this is a, a valid point. Thank you. Thank you. Terrific talk. Um, uh -huh. I have also a question related to the uh, breast cancer prediction of the PHR data. So I noted that you mentioned individual patient or participant, they may have one visit, they could have three visits. Yeah. So I was wondering, uh, did you, if they have multiple visits, did you use all of them or did you use in the last visit? No, no, we used all of them, but we used this uh, pseudo intervaling idea. So, so but what, of course, if, if you, when you use the first event, then the distance to the cancer will be maybe larger or we, we only predicted up to two years from the event so yeah. this was so, a limitation so, so, so if you use all of them have you actually compared just using the last visit yeah so it, it actually improves by using multiple visits we did this test yeah another question is um since i'm uh, researching natural language processing i have to ask did you try to using the free text information in the ehr for uh, supplement your uh, prediction no yet, not yet. This is on our to-do list. Yeah. Thanks for this great talk. Yeah, I was curious about the intent method that you mentioned in this case to do canonical correspondence analysis. You compared this to RAT, which is also based on CCA. Can you have the differences in this two? So uh, you know the difference is in the training phase that we do because we uh, you know select the genes that are uh, uh, that are used in the model uh, based on uh, on the training phase for, for which we have both the DNA methylation and uh, uh, and uh, uh, gene expression data. Uh, for SERA, uh, we also needed to provide uh, gene level uh, signal for the DNA methylation. So we summarize the DNA methylation signal in the plus minus 10 kb uh, window as we did for our case. So this, uh, uh, this uh, summary is the same, but the difference is uh, the, the way we use the, you know, the regression in order to pick the genes and then to filter them using the variance across the methods. You're right, the CCA is the same. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I had a question about your uh, driver journey uh, project uh, or presentations. So I was wondering, uh, since you're looking at subregions which appear to have uh, stronger effects uh, on on the uh, in terms of driving the cancer, did you find that your outcome is that you were choosing driver genes that were transcription factors? Because I would suspect that they would. Uh, have a greater effect on uh, differential gene expression. So, so again, driver gene that are? That are transcription factors. Are those ones that you're pulling out as a bias? 
we haven't looked uh, at this point. No, we, what we did look is that uh, we're comparing our results to the actionable genes, and we so see a lot of overlap. So actionable genes are often transcription factors, but we didn't look at this directly. This is a good point. Yeah, I would suspect that to be the case because you're looking at stronger effects uh, when you're as you, as you catch some of the genes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Great. Uh, well, this is also the last message. Um, you know, all data sets now where uh, systematic CRISPR uh, deletion of genes have been done together with uh, single cell transcription. And could that be helpful to, to reverse engineer and see from a transcription profile what are the mutated driver genes? Have you, have you looked into this? No, we haven't done this. Yeah, that's uh, a different approach to the same problem. Yeah. Could be interesting. Yeah. Uh, hello, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have a question about identifying the access models in the network. How aware is the network with cell compositions and the different, you know, the feature of feature of that maybe of the cell compositions in the both on music or transcription methods? <laughs> so the method is completely oblivious to. Uh, the way this the set of gene was obtained. So as I said, one way to obtain the set of genes was to look at expression profile and look at differential genes. And this could be done on the single cell level, or it could be done on a, a batch, uh, you know, on bulk uh, level. And on the other hand, it could be obtained from a GWAS study where you just compute the significance, you know, the correlation of each uh, mutation with the phenotype and pick those that pass the threshold. So essentially what you get as input is a subset of the genes, no matter how you got it. Uh, and you're right you might get a cleaner signal if you are uh, looking at a single cell level, but the problem of over-reporting uh, will, will remain unless we do something to correct them as we propose here. Uh, well, there's just a, a question from the online audience. Uh -huh. um, regarding the breast cancer longitudinal study, um, why not use Cox proportional hazards model or the accelerated failure time model? Well, so actually we compared our method to Cox. This was one of the competitors and uh, we showed that we are doing better than, than Cox model. Yeah, this is a classical method. This was one of the first thing to compare to 